Hello, hello, hello. This is hello, hello, hello. This is my favorite stage. I, I don't say that for every stage, even when it sounds like a bit. I'm very happy that you're here. You can have more than one favorite stage. It's the same with children, best friends. Okay, we're going to dive right into it. I've been looking forward to this session all day. Um, and that's also not something I say for every session. Me too, Sonia, my conversation partner here today. I don't have to introduce her, but I do it anyway. She's an author, cultural scientist, scientist, uh, author, and she's working for media and the um, German Bundeszentrale für Bildsche Bildung on topics such as racism and post-colonialism, the latter of which we're also going to be talking about today. Her works have uh, received multiple prizes, and her first novel, Identity, has been published at Hansa Verlag recently. The book made it to the shortlist of the German Literature uh, Award and also gained uh, other awards in the German-speaking sphere. So her novel is going to be published at Hansa Verlag this year. It's going to be about violence and how to deal with it. So I'm very happy that she's here today and we can have this conversation. Dr. Mitu Sanyal, give her a big hand. I'm super happy to be here. I'm a huge fan of you. I'm a huge fan of Republika. And uh, yeah, returned. No, I'm, I'm too nervous to do this in front of people now. I'm going to do this later. I'm going to want, really want to try it. Also, we don't have a lot of time, so we need to get started immediately. We hear that the public discourse has narrowed. And how narrow is it actually? Is it as bad as never before? or? Is there just a bit, a, a, a bit much of pessimism going on? You know, I've been politicized in the 80s, and that's also where it was uh, as bad as never before. We thought the world's going to end tomorrow. Everything was horrible. But there is currently a new quality today. What we have is not just that, oh, you know, um, the right-wing extremist haters or the, um, the bourgeois haters, but also the discourse within the left has... Uh, created giant gaps and that's what really kind of startled me there's a lot of criticism i think the critic uh, the session title is also who's afraid of post-colonialism and so on i had hoped that maybe it would be on the screen um at its core the the term vogue or post-colonialism by itself isn't anything bad the definition of vogue is f-american slang usually meant the perspective of black people uh, or in our context of all marginalized people to have a specific awareness of discrimination and the associated dangers. But currently it's being used as a, uh, a term in, in the right wing, but also nowadays within the left, who are making it out to be a bad thing. So what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding regarding the term Vogue or also post-colonialism? Okay, where do we start? So. What's curious about Vogue is that it's kind of um, a rehash of the political correctness debate on the 80s, where right-wing think, think tanks published lots of articles, something nobody knew before, something they just completely made up, like an acronym, wow, PC, that's uh, the enemy, the, the acronym is uh, the enemy. And they put a lot of energy into it. and in the UK and the US, you can see the same thing with the term Vogue. Who's launching what? It always filters into German a little bit differently, but the issue is, as with everything in the um, cultural sphere, you have to pick out something and, and declare it to be true and then also make it big. And it's not that there's no criticism that's, that's justified, but they try to frame it as Vogue in total, and the totality of Vogue being being such and such. And that there's things, um, for example, Susan Miner said, it's so unpolitical. We all talk about identity politics, in, uh, in quotes. Vogue um, identity politics, and everything is just kind of thrown into one uh, big pot, and the, the lines are blurred. 
And so now we're only looking at or talking about how many brown or black faces are somewhere. We don't talk about capitalism anymore, for example. And there I have to say, yes, I agree, but that's not our fault. But it's very largely thanks to media who want to focus on things like, oh, but who can play a certain role in a certain movie? Can right-handed people play a left-handed person? It's obviously about what's allowed, what's disallowed. Can you make us a list? It's about scandals and blowing things up. And that is usually dysfunctional. And they're even more dysfunctional than in the rest of society, where in society we can maybe think about why we take very small differences and then blow them up very large. In philosophy, there's a theory that the closer you are politically, the uh, wider the gaps appear. It's also, we can see, see that in the left, MLPD, the Marxist-Leninist party, and, and other parties, they have this whole thing going on. You're anti-imperialist, you're anti-German, we, we cannot even find common ground. Um, so there is an issue there that these differences are, are being amplified a lot. But another issue is that we don't look at it and, and look for actual reasons for criticism, maybe. It's, it's not about, oh, I only want black people to be able to play black roles. But it's about realizing that we have a structural issue, that there's far too few black roles for black actors. So unless there's, like, parentheses, one black woman uh, or one black man, then by default, um, roles will be cast by uh, for white people, because that's the, the public norm. You know, it's just an invisible default. And when you're marked, for example, by being black, then you can only play marked roles. And now if, if white people also want to take on all the roles that are marked, then there's nothing left. So that's the, the issue here. Um, it's not just about, you know, I can authentically um, represent uh, women. That's not what it's about. Um, it's about the debates behind the deconstructive debates that in this uh, media analysis have become invisible. I mean, we're both part of this media carousel that has this, this effect. So we create the thing that we then want to fight against. So how can we try to resist? How can we take ourselves out of this carousel? Label it, criticize it? Yeah, I, th I think maybe, maybe not anymore. Um, I've published articles online that are especially dysfunctional, um, that have lots of uh, clicks, and that was my fault. And I believe that attention is a currency in, in our circle, so I try to amplify the constructive things, I try to give them reach. I also try to ignore specific things, that's the nice thing after having weathered a few storms, you uh, and survived of course. But if you, once you survive these storms, you realize they're not as bad anymore. People are going to hate you, but life goes on. Like my son also hates me every three days or so, um, but life goes on. So this idea that we have to continue coexisting within the same world, like even if we cancel somebody, they, they won't stop existing. So we still need to kind of deal with them. and. At the moment, I try to invest less energy into a uh, resistance or refusal. But then we get these attacks against post-colonial studies, for example, and then that stopped working. So attacks such as all post-colonial studies are anti-Semitic. Like, you cannot ignore that. You can't say, I won't talk about it. Because in, in Germany, that clearly goes to the core of what we all believe in. So you have to respond to these crazy arguments and that's where it gets really really difficult because you cannot prove that you're not anti-semitic you, you, can, you cannot prove that you are something you can even less prove that you are not something it's impossible to, to prove for me that I'm German or that I'm Indian or you know you cannot prove that you are not anti-semitic so one would argue by not acting in an anti-semitic fashion then you would be anti-Semitic, but it only means you haven't done it yet. You haven't been anti-Semitic yet. So especially if you look at post-colonial studies, there's a whole area of science that is still very young. 
um, like around 50 years still, but, but lots of people wrote lots and lots of texts in there. And it's a bit like saying, oh, I don't like literature. Literature is anti-Semitic. Yes, yes, it is. Parts of literature are, of course. Um, but it's also so many other things. Do we have to learn to endure this? Uh, this, this uh, same timeness of things. Yeah, I think it would be nice, but I would already appreciate it if our political debate would be a little bit less moralizing. They always argue with morals. I would appreciate a bit more pragmatism here. And maybe an example would be, I mean, really all things, but if I want to work together with other people on things, I don't need to like all every single post that they've done ever. I can work with people pragmatically. Um, I can say there's certain points where we can collaborate. Um, I was invited to uh, to the, the couch format. I was with some person whose name I can't remember anymore um, and a person who had an abortion or several abortions and another person that said abortion is murder. So in all other points, we were the same opinion. Um, that care for pregnant people is shit in Germany, that there's not enough places for giving birth, etc. But I always wanted to take it back to this one point where we disagreed on. And yeah, we're not going to find like, common ground there. We can talk about all the other things where we do agree on. And for me, it was interesting that at some point she said, oh, that was the first time that somebody actually looked at my position, um, even if they disagreed with it, but respected it. And I noticed that we argue Uh, at the same level of, of disrespect to political opinions that we really strongly dislike, where we sometimes even see contempt uh, for other political opinions. But yeah, I can have a different political opinion, um, but also they don't have power over me. It's different if, if there is a power relationship here. Would I go into this dialogue? Or do I maybe uh, send someone ahead that can also defend me? Um, who's not directly affected, but this idea that we are also contemptuous, maybe we could find uh, a different approach. And one of the arguments against Vogue is that, oh, they know everything, um, they know it all. And yeah, maybe that's one approach. Even, even if people, people know things better than I do, I don't need to be as affronted. Well, yes, and What I mean is that not 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 only woke people are know-it-alls, but throughout my life I've I've always been in situations where in situations of power, not power on the uh, on the labor market, power at work, power in education, but power in a nearly multimedia discourse where people who were marginalized. Um, joined the conversation and the reaction to that was as if it was the end of the Occident that this was against free speech that free speech was being limited and I of course I support I think free speech is one of the highest values highest goods in our society but right now people are being denied speech um, they, they're not allowed to visit conferences, for example. It's about that. It's not about censoring online forums or something. Um, so, where, hmm, who, who has the power to say that um, free speech should be regulated? Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> We we had a we had a conversation before this talk, and uh, we talked about the f fact that we suddenly have very high expectations to people in in discourse that we ourselves can't can't really fulfill. Can you can you explain that? Yes, there there's for example the bias when I read a study and that study confirms what I believe. It's a scientific study. I say yeah, great. Um, but um, on the other hand, when I look at a study that says, I don't know, the brain of women, the women's brain can't, the female brain can't do certain things, then I immediately reject that study. But of course, I have, have a bias when I look at certain things. 
you mentioned that the novel that I'm writing it's about people in the who um, resisted the colonial powers with uh, were armed in the early twentieth uh, second twentieth uh, century and these people were really tough uh, had a, had a real struggle because they needed to prove that they were doing the good kind of resistance and um, that's interesting because they also have a lot of lot less power to uh, to conduct these things and I think the way that we resist needs to reach the core of society but I think it's uh, I think it's too much to ask for the perfect resistance but especially <laughs> when um, people are asking for um, non-disruptive resistance like strikes on, on days when nobody t needs to take the train now of course that's resistance has to disrupt and that's part of our de democracy and we are currently in the process of losing democratic values and uh, people in a society have rights and they don't need to be perfect they don't need to be involved in debate all the time and that's also a way to nip things in the bud before they've had a chance to to f uh, to experiment bef and if you have have such high expectations then people are going to not say anything yes and also people aren't even being listened to when they resist for example in the Gaza process uh, protests but also in North Rhine Westphalia care workers at the uh, at the uh, university hospitals were on strike and the media hardly reported on that and when they did the reports were mostly about the how irresponsible this was to towards patients that and there wasn't even a political dimension to this a protest was delegitimized before people were being listened to and that's a a very common reaction uh, at the same time we say we want resistance um, but it has to be done right and um, uh, that that could also happen from people who are interested in uh, the persistence of the status quo. Yes, of course, and of course, criticism is 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 okay. But all criticism is being being seen as an attack on democracy. And I think democracy. We either have to strengthen democracy, or we have to stop pretending that we have a free press. We're not in Russia. We don't. There is no the m the media aren't under state control. But the idea that that there aren't filters in media, that aren't there are things that can't be said, that everything is a right wing narrative. That's that's a lie. <laughs> well, and because something is being co opted from the right, and I never thought I'd say this, that doesn't mean there needs to be a core of truth. Yes, and that's what I mean by, by by being pragmatic. And people contain multitudes, and that's the problem with that new book. There are characters in this, in the book, whose politics I find uh, I really dislike, but they 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 have a point. And there's this expectations thesis these these aren't my expectations not towards myself or other people that we have to agree on everything and that if we don't that everything else is delegitimized um, but I sometimes wonder how did we get there when did that happen I have the feeling that one of the large turning points was the COVID pandemic where suddenly other opinions were disallowed and that was one of the my learnings from covid all my friends were were really good um 
um, left-wing people, journalists. They, um, but I know some some punks who were different, and with now that enough time has passed, that that was good. That there was a different position. I uh, attended some events. Um, when I was in the taxi, the taxi drivers told me an entirely different story. And when you listen to the media, you th you, you'd have thought that everybody agreed, and that's not the case. Um, <laughs> I, that's, um, well, what I wanted to say, to say about COVID is that I had a friend who did everything differently. And at some point, I had to decide that um, friendships are more important to me than politics and that was a really tough thing to learn yeah I, I don't disagree on on principle but with covid there was this foundational idea that okay even the expert might not know everything but i they at least know more than i do so and, and i'm not going to read up on on all of this to to say that i'm i disagree on disagree with them right totally but that's that's the tricky part like all the people i was close to put community over the individual but democracy means um balancing the rights of the individual and the needs of the community and um we we said that okay we're doing one thing and the other part isn't that important um and the, my, my friend is from the women's health movement. She's always been critical towards um, towards Big Pharma and said, sorry, we know how dangerous vaccinations are for, for children. I was, I thought, oh my God, what's this? But I, but I, I noticed that people put so much more pressure on her. They're trying to convince her of something. And then, of course, we we went from one crisis to another. The war in Ukraine started, the uh, uh, and with uh, even more so with the war in in Gaza. And I had to decide: okay, I love you, you're my best friend, um, but we're going to disagree on this, and we're going to talk about that. Of course, I don't want to stop talking about it, but neither of us is responsible for what's happening politically we're going to try to to find a, a sense I mostly agree with you I we talked about the roles that people have and I think it's important that there are radical people or punks as you call them who question things and who try to to push the boundaries but there, we also need people who try to to transmit this, try to talk about uh, talk in, in all directions, and who don't um, cancel their their friendship. So where do you draw that board and uh, that that boundary? That's a good question. I, I the most difficult part for me was that suddenly the left was supposed to be of one opinion, and that that was never the case before. There's never been an opinion that's a hundred percent correct for everyone. And uh, we're still having those debates. Like, how was it was it right to close schools, for example? How what did that do to children's uh, psyches? We were so hard, and not because we're not be, not because we're so woke. We we were so hard because we we, we were so tough. No, we weren't so tough because we we're, were German either. It was the same in other countries. But of course, fear makes you tough. And what I noticed is that. We are very quick to put people in categories. We're not saying, OK, you, you, we disagree on this. We're, we're putting a label on people. Right, you, you put a label on a person, and then suddenly you no longer have to listen to them. And now even pacifist has become become a label. And it's, it's Pacifist has been my identity throughout my life. I've got a real problem here. But if you're on the other side of this and say that, okay, we disagree on this, but there are other values I want to talk about. And when you notice how how far away a discourse can stray from that, then you have to wonder, is do we save the world? Do we save discourse by, by shaming people? Or isn't that the way that we, isn't that even more of a threat to discourse? And sure, I don't have to invite everyone to a talk show, 
Well, that would have been my next question. Do we have to listen to everyone? Do we have to talk to everyone? Well, it depends on the forum. It depends on where. I don't have to invite someone on to a panel, but that's different from saying that your opinion is evil, and that's what what happens when you when you have moral politics. There are there are the, the, the yeah the, there may be positions that I share, some that I don't. We 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 weren't supposed to talk about COVID. It's because it's uh, such a it's it's in the past. Well, that's that says a lot about the current situation as well because we we only have one and a half minutes left. So I would like to come back to uh, I would like to give people something to take home and to ask how what does it look to approach other people how can we how can we um, shape the future oh the one million dollar question right at the end um, before this panel we were talking about hope and hope is one of the resources that's uh, currently uh, the scarcest with with me and it's one of my personal political decisions that I'm not going to give up hope we're going to continue coexisting on this planet we have to work it out together and that's really tough at the moment yeah I agree but you didn't say how we're going to do this I th I believe that we need to talk about what we want to fight for the question tends to be are you against this or that but I think we have to talk about what we want to fight for, but mostly it's continuing the conversation. And I don't have to do that with uh, with the right wing. If Mark, I think Mark Twain says, be, be, before we start loving our enemies, we should um, treat our friends better. Better. It's unfortunate that we have to end on uh, Mark Twain. But um, uh, thank you so much for this conversation. I could have I could have kept talking to you for hours, but. The, I think um, the, the timer is flashing red. I think we have to end on this. Thank you so much for this conversation. And thank you all for be having been here.